Hello and thank you for joining us. My name's Simon Weir and I'm from Mont Blanc and I'm going to be your host for this exciting broadcast event. You join me here at the Goodwood Estate, home of the Goodwood Festival of Speed. For the last five years, Mont Blanc has been the official timekeeping partner of the festival, one of the world's most renowned celebrations of motorsport. Our relationship with the festival may only be five years young, yet watchmaking and motorsport have been in step since the dawn of the automotive industry. Minerva has an association that can be traced back over a century from the early stopwatches right the way through to some of the most amazing dashboard counters. The link between Mont Blanc and racing timekeeping dates back to the 50s when Minerva was setting the standard for precision timekeeping with the, ra the dashboard rally counter. This was really the ultimate instrument to celebrate motorsport passion. When Mont Blanc was entrusted with Minerva, not only did they acquire the racing and sporting heritage, but they also discovered a rich history of military timepieces based on precision. And it's the coming together of these three core elements that have informed us and inspired us to create the 1858 collection. And what better place to present that collection than here at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. Welcome back. You join me now in the company of the 11th Duke of Richmond, the founder of the Goodwood Festival of Speed. Your Grace, thank you so much for welcoming us inside your wonderful home today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. This is the fifth year of Mont Blanc being the timekeeping partner of the festival. And what a special partnership that is. There's also a very special relationship between time and speed. And I wondered, Your Grace, what is it about racing against the clock that so captures the imagination of so many motorsport fans? I, mean, I think there are lots of uh, fascinating connections, but I mean, I think the big one is, 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 and especially here, is all about accuracy. You've got to be really, really, really on it, and you've got to be super specific, and that you've got to do a kind of perfect run. Really, it's very, very short. We're talking about less than a mile. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's about a mile. Okay. And, um, and so to, to be fast and to win, you've got to be super accurate. All right, so really no second chances at all. You just get that one shot and you've got to well, get it. It's like it. a qualifying run, I guess. You know, okay. it's, 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 it's like qualifying in F1 or something. You know, you've got to go for that time and you've got to go once and you've really got that one game. But here you have only got really, you will have done, everyone has to do a practice session first. Okay. But it's not like in qualifying where you do lap after lap and then do your fast lap. Here you've just got to, you have one go, you're on the start line, and you go from a standing start, wow. which is obviously unusual. So the speed to the first corner is very, very, very important. So the electric cars have been doing, the electric race cars um, have been doing you know, very, very well. And obviously Volkswagen hold that record at the moment with their Pikes Peak cars being the fastest car ever up here. Wow, so what, what time did they actually Well, they do, they're achieve? all running under 50 seconds now, so it's, it's wow. an amazing time, yeah. Your Grace, obviously the festival, you've seen it grow over so, so many years, and how do you see it positioned now with being very much one of the main events of the summer season? Yes, yeah, it's, it's been amazing. It's been an amazing uh, ride since 93, really. When we told we get a couple of thousand people here and 25,000 people burst in, and then it's grown oh. and grown and grown to about 200 plus now. Um, do you think that there's now that broader appeal that it's not only motorsport fans that come, but actually sort of people that are interested in luxury and interested in, in the other aspects that you show here? 
Absolutely, it's a very kind of lifestyle event. And anyway, we wouldn't attract, be attracting that many people if it was really focused on the kind of very, very niche motorsport. So the cars are kind of going on in the background and there's lots of other things going on. Lots of, um, you know, this whole future lab, we're looking at the future te technology, especially around mobility and connectivity. We've got a massive thing on electric. Uh, we've got many other areas of, uh, of focus. So it's, it's a, I hope it's just a really great and interesting and exciting and, and uh, you know, a very unusual day out. This, is a big, this, this, whole, this whole show is a big part of the industry. It's the only opportunity, one of the few opportunities in the world that car companies really have to all come together, all show everyone what they're doing in a very relaxed and informal way and actually show it to the world rather than themselves. So it's, it's, you know, it's a very, this is a very unusual type of motor show. I was going to say, because I think now it's probably one of the largest events like this anywhere in the world, isn't it, as far as I know? Well, it's considered by many to be the biggest greenfield site build in the world, actually, amazingly. Oh, wow. So this build, we're building a city here, as you can see, pretty much, and it is huge. And the, uh, the extent of the stands that are built and the, and the, and the, sort of the quality of the construction, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. We've got enough electricity here for a city, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so when do you actually start putting everything together? When does it start sort of start yeah, being uh, built. Well, it's quite a big the, commitment, it's three months in and out. Okay. So, um, and we start at the top, you know, quite early. So we, we would have started two months ago. Wow. Uh, plus, and then we're down, intensely down here, you know, right to the end, so it'll be flat out. This is, this, you know, you're talking to me at my most intense moment. So <laughs> it starts, I'm, I'm due on the start line in about 15 minutes, and then it all begins. Fantastic. And look, we really do thank you very, very much for your time. Grace. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, Your Grace. Earlier in the week, I was lucky enough to catch up with my colleague, Laurent Lacan, who's the managing director of our watch division. And we were able to have a much closer look at our 1858 collection. Hi Laurent, it's great to see you again. Thank you so much for giving us your time this evening uh, to be with us. I do trust and it looks from, from where I'm sitting that the weather in Switzerland a little bit nicer than what we have here in London at the moment. Hello Simon, thank you for hosting this important event. I know you'll be sharing some of your highlights of the Festival of Speed and I look forward to it. Regarding the weather, please, no comment. Absolutely, Law. I'm really looking forward to sharing some of the insights and behind the scenes uh, footage that we captured at the festival a little bit later. Before we dive in and really start talking about watches in more detail, I do have one little question for you. Um, I was wondering, does your love of things mechanical actually go beyond just talking about timepieces. Yeah, we share something with you. I am the lucky owner of a Porsche, a 928S. Nice. The date of birth is uh, November, 1st of November, 1983. It became a, we say, veteran in Switzerland. Uh, it was in 1914, on 30th uh, of, of, of November. And uh, the car has, only 67,000 kilometers. Wow. It's a white one. And um, it's something very emotional because I, I bought the car to my father-in-law. It means that uh, my father-in-law bought it, was the first owner. He wanted to keep the car for me in the next years. But I decided to, to, to buy the car because he wanted to sell it. I have to say, I look forward to being in this car during the weekend. There is something very emotional and I'm happy because I can imagine how my father-in-law was in this car like 10 years or 20 years ago. So it's something extremely emotional. Amazing. I can really see that your passion isn't just about vintage timepieces, but also vintage cars as well. And I do have to say, I think your daughter will be very lucky to receive that when she turns 18 and passes her driving test. Before we talk about a specific uh, timepiece or even a specific collection, I just wondered if you'd be able to share with us this evening, and especially for our guests at home, a little bit more of an insight into the history of Minerva, their dedication to precision, and their fascination and their support of motorsport through their very long and varied history. In the early part of the uh, 1900s, Minerva had this first. First stopwatch to measure the fifths, tens, the hundreds of a second. And it was the start of precision timekeeping for the manufacturer. But I want to tell you, Minerva has a long history with timekeeping. It was the official timekeeper for the 1936 Winter Olympics. Therefore, getting involved with racing was a natural progression. By the way, now 
I am in our museum in Villeray, and everything I explained to you is just behind me. And uh, I see a picture, but you cannot see this picture, it's quite far, but it's about the Winter Olympics, 1936. So everything is connected. Huh? I'm happy to be here with you today because what I explained is just behind me, not behind in terms of date, but behind in terms of physically just behind me as well. <laughs> wow. And um, the rally timer was initially used by the engineers in the pit lanes during the race. One of the drivers then thought it could be a very good idea to have it mounted on the dashboard so the drivers could see the individual timings immediately. As we know that you're in the Minerva archive this evening, I was just wondering whether we could get a look at maybe one of those vintage rally timers that you were talking about just now. So now we'll have to explain to you shortly how it works. It has been developed in the 60s. You have to imagine that it was placed inside the cars, okay? To see immediately, to have all information about the time. So how does it work? Very simple. Start, stop, and reset. But you also have the flyback function. Start, reset, and start again immediately. It was in the 60s. And then we've developed in 2017 this beautiful timepiece. This is something you can place on the table, for example. As you see, you can easily maintain it on the table, or you can even put it on your wrist. Here, you can open it and you put the strap inside. And the design is exactly the same, only the size is different. That's absolutely fascinating. And I do remember when I was fortunate enough to visit the manufacturer, um, I do remember being shown this amazing photograph of, I believe, I think it was the two sons of Charles Yvan Robert, who was the founder of Minerva. Uh, yes. <laughs> and they were driving actually one of the very early motor cars. And I remember at the time being told that, I think it was the Robert family, were actually the very first owners of a, of a motor vehicle in the village of Villaray. And I was just wondering, do you think that maybe that led to the kind of their inspiration and the way that they developed these very specific timing devices that we used in motorsport? You ask a lot of questions, huh, Simon. Now I have a question for you. Because I see you are extremely well informed. Would you please share with me the company, the brand name of the first car that has been bought by Charles Robert here in Villeray, which was, by the way, the first car bought in Villeray. You see, the photo I saw was from the side and I couldn't see the badge of the make of the car. So I, I, I don't know, I have no idea. But nobody knows, so it's, uh, very, it's good to know. <laughs> it's the Fiat. Oh, it was wow. the first car bought by Charles Robert and it was the first car in Villeray. Wow. Interesting. And now it's difficult to move my camera, but I would try. I don't know if you will have a good look or not at this, but yes. Do you see the house here? Yes. This was the house of the owner of the company. And Charles Robert, who bought the, manufact the, uh, the, the Fiat, he was living in this house. You see? Oh, wow. Amazing. So now, and here you see the mountains, by the way, with a V shape. I will explain to you later what it is about. It's completely incredible. You have to imagine that here you have the, the, the house of the owner. You have the house of the sons of the owner. And um, a Fiat car was needed for 200 meters to go from the father <laughs> to the sons. But that's another story. I know that you have a very special piece that you'd like to showcase for us today. Yes, this piece here was crafted during a time when Minerva was really honing its skills. Now, also the 1858 collection is based on our military history and not strictly created for the racing. If it wasn't for the real work in military watches, we wouldn't have developed the savoir-faire to create timepieces like the Rally Time. And tonight, I would like to share with you something really incredible. 
developed here in Villeray by Minerva engineers. And the name of this incredible model is the 1858 Origins. Origins because back to the roots. What you see here on the left has been developed in the 30s. It's a 46 millimeter diameter case in steel. And you can observe at 12, you have the Minerva logo on the dial. Here you have the chronograph functions. It's a mono pusher chronograph. And you have the 30 minute counter at three and here the small second. And now have a look at the piece on the right. It looks exactly the same. It is the same by the way, but it is the new one. The case is in bronze. The dial, the hands, the functions, everything the same. But if you pay attention to the Minerva logo that has appeared, we placed by Mont Blanc. But Mont Blanc is Minerva and Minerva is Mont Blanc. That's why the Minerva logo has been removed and placed here at six o'clock. But not as a name, but as a logo. This logo is the original logo uh, of Minerva. And now let's have a look at the other side of these timepieces. Here in the 30s, nothing. Clearly, it's only steel. Here on the other side, something extremely innovative, something extremely exclusive, never been developed before in watch making industry. What you see here is the Minerva Goddess. The Minerva Goddess has been engraved, but it is colored engraving. And we're using a new technology that we are the only one in Switzerland to use at that time for the engraving on the case back. It is based, based sorry, on the um, oxidation process. It means that this part is not in bronze, it is titanium. And we're using a laser. And the laser will modify the titanium depending on the angle of the laser, for this angle or this angle, depending on the distance between the case pack and the laser. And depending on the intensity of the laser, we will be able to create the depths, the contour, and even the colors on the case pack. I insist on one point, this technology has been developed by Mont Blanc, is very unique in Switzerland. And I have another surprise for you. What is in the head of Minerva, of the goddess? Do you know what is in her head? I will show you. Wow. This is something really, really incredible. What you see here is absolutely unique. First of all, unique because you have a text inside. The text is in French. Réédition du chronographe militaire Minerva des années 30, doté d'un calibre fait main dans la pure tradition horlogère suisse. In English, it means reedition of the military Minerva chronograph from the 30s, equipped with a handmade caliber respecting the purest Swiss watchmaking tradition. And now let's have a look together at this unique movement. Everything you see, I insist, everything has been assembled by only one watchmaker. All the components you see, I insist one more time, all the components you see have been developed by our team internally. We belong to the very last manufacturers in Switzerland still capable of producing their own spirits. That's extremely rare. And we're one of the last one still capable of doing everything by hand internally. If you pay attention to the ratchet of the movement here, and when I move the watch, you see the ratchet, the design is changing on the ratchet. It shows like very delicate spirals. You see this? Yes, Sorry. we can see it. You see? This is made by hand. It's a savoir-faire 
met by one lady. This lady is working for us, has been working for the brand for more than 21 years now. And she's in charge of this. This is a savoir faire that has been preserved by our company, but it has completely disappeared in Switzerland. Then you have something very interesting, which is the V-shaped bridge. And I would like to show you again something so that you can understand what it is made of. Let's have a look at the mountains in front of us. You see this V shape? Clearly the V shape. Now you have to imagine something. Since 1858, our watchmaker sits every day since so every day in the morning, very early, by the way, huh? five or six o'clock, they sit walking on the watchmaker table, observing the V-shaped beautiful mountain. And in 1912, this V-shape and the movement has been patented. And we have two stories for this. The first one is, of course, this V-shape is because of the chronograph function on the other side, on the dial. That's why we have V-shape for one, uh, one part indicating the chrono central hand and the other one, the 30 minute counter on the dial. But I have something more romantic to explain to you. And as a French and Swiss guy, I prefer the romance, you know? So it's more emotional, more romantic. People say that our watchmakers fell in love with these two mountains in front of us. This V-shape was in the heart of our watchmakers. And for that, and because uh, thanks to this gift from, for, for, from the nature, we decided to develop this beautiful V-shape on the movement. And this V-shape is the signature of the Mont Blanc, Villeray, Minerva timepieces. That's such an amazing story. And then, because it's a romantic one. Yes, exactly. That's why, and it's a real one. It's not fake, everything is real. That's why it's magical. That's why it's completely different. And here you find on the bridges and uh, on the plate as well, you can see the finishing. It looks like uh, slightly yellow. This is the German silver finishing. It's a very old finishing that was used in this industry in the past and that has been completely abandoned because it's a high cost to do it and so on. We pay attention to the details coming from our past, coming from the tradition, coming from the summer fair. Then very beautiful Simon, this part here. Observe the chronograph function and here you have the Minerva arrow. Do you see this? Yeah. The Minerva arrow at the end of the chronograph blocker. And last but not least, we are working with 18,000 alternances and harrow. Give me just a few seconds to give birth to the piece. It starts living. You give birth to this piece while winding the crown. And the noise is so romantic. This timepiece is a limited edition, 100 pieces only in bronze with the titanium case pack with the Minerva engraving, very innovative technology and handmade movements. And something very, very exclusive and unique. Thank you so much, Lon. That's absolutely fantastic. Just one other question. When you're looking at the vintage pieces and you're going through the archive, how do you decide which elements that you want to keep? And it's, I suppose, in a sense, which are the elements that inspire you to put forward into the modern pieces so that we're able to continue that story and really share the legacy of Minerva with the modern collections today? Let me share with you a personal story. I'm very lucky because I have a daughter. She's love of my life. <laughs> Her name is Leana. And Leana is three years and uh, six months. And uh, the first time I was at home with the Villeray timepiece in my hands, she took the piece and she observed the piece, the piece. She just turned it and observed the movement. And she told me, 
Waouh, papa, c'est magnifique. Imagine my daughter, three years and six months, saying, hey, dad, this is so beautiful. And I was asking her, why is it so beautiful? And she, she has no words to explain, huh? okay? So the, the, the only words, it's uh, papa, maman, uh, je t'aime, <laughs> je veux manger, and so on. But she tried to explain with her fingers, touching on the sapphire and explaining that I love this, I love this, I love this. And I thought, I understood that if a child can fall in love with such a timepiece, it means that an adult will fall in love as well. And um, clearly, I always say, I always explain to my team, when we have to do something and if we want to be sure that it will be accepted by adults, you have to test with children. And I would like to share a story with you if you allow me. It's a one minute story, shortly. A few years ago, I was in an exhibition in Monaco at the Monte Carlo Bay Hotel. And uh, there were no customer. And then only one customer came to me. It was a young boy. He was seven or eight years old. He stopped at each and every booth. And all the brands paid no attention to him. Young boy, what are you expecting? And then he came to my booth. And he was asking questions about the products I was displaying. And I decided to spend time with him. And uh, I explained my products. 45 minutes. I spent 45 minutes. It was the best experience in my life in terms of product development. But the thing is, that's something magical. And the energy of life was bringing something incredible to me. He left the room. All the brands came to me and said, Laurent, it's crazy. You lost 45 minutes of your time. Why do you spend so much time with the child? But say, he was very interested. I wanted to share with him my passion. It was very, very good for me to do it. And I learned a lot of things as well. So, okay. During the afternoon, what did happen to me? He no, came back. Nice. He came back. He came back with his father. The father was a Russian guy. Strong, big, very serious. And uh, he asked him, so show me the guy who he explained to you everything about the timepiece. And uh, everybody, was everybody was observing me. I said, who, what is happening? The father came to me and said, which watch did you explain to my son? And I just showed to the father the watch I've explained. And uh, the father, he told me, I want to buy it. I said, but uh, let me explain the, the watch or give the price. He said, no, 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 I don't care. I buy it because my son explained to me everything in detail. He was in love with this piece. I want it for my personal collection. Wow. That's something incredible. And in life, I think we all have to pay attention to what we do. A customer can be eight years old or 98 years old. A customer is not someone buying. For me, the customer is someone who pays attention to what we are doing. He's someone who is interested in sharing his passion, who wants to know our savoir-faire, our passion, and he wants someone to explain. And if you do this, if you share with people, then it always comes back to you, I would say. In that case, luckily, he bought the piece, but I didn't care what more the most important. I was very lucky, very lucky to, to speak to this, uh, the child. And at the end, I was lucky because he bought the piece as well, of course, but it was not my main goal. So this story is very interesting. And once again, it means how important it is to pay attention to the children and especially for luxury. And this is something you will not learn in the books, believe me. <laughs> and I, I, I'm a teacher at the university. I teach about luxury, about strategy in luxury. I, I give a lot of conferences. I write books. And every time uh, I explain to the students, if you want to be successful in luxury, just pay attention to all details. Pay attention to the children. Pay attention to all what you see. And please have curiosity. Curiosity is the key to everything. And about passion, when I started working here at Villeray, my first question was, please tell me how many years on average can a watchmaker work for a company or are they working for a company? And the answer was Laurent, one of our watchmakers has been working more than 58 years for the company, 58 years. 
I was in Japan, I was working in Japan as CEO for a company, and in Japan, I learned something. In Japanese companies, on average, people work 25, 30 years, average. And especially when you have family businesses, it's more than this. And here I was so surprised, 50 years, how comes? And then I wanted to know more about it. And uh, one of my colleagues explained to me that it's a family story because his father was working for the company as well. And he has been working more than 40 years. It means father and son together, 100 years history for our, uh, with our company. Wow. Passion is key. And if you feel the emotion now, when I explain this to you, it means that you are very sensitive to this. And it means you are full of passion, what I hope for you, really. And in that case, this is the key to success. Thank you, Laurent, for taking us into the archive and for bringing to life the history of Minerva, being able to share the amazing passion that's within the manufacturer, their connection to motorsport and the driving force of precision timekeeping, and also seeing how all of this actually inspires our modern collections today. Thank you again, Lauren. It was great to catch up and hear a little bit more about the collection. The mood here in Goodwood today is fantastic. So let's have a look at some of the highlights so far. That's all we have time for today. I'd like to thank all of my guests, the Duke of Richmond, Laurent, and everyone that's joined us from all over the world. It's been wonderful being able to share with you the 1858 collection, but also to give you a taste of the thrills and spills that make up the Goodwood Festival of Speed. I really hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>